we all come across challenging people from time to time. You say, well, Pastor Burns, define a challenging person. Well, I'm talking about someone who maybe is argumentative, hard to please. Uh, maybe you've dealt with a neighbor where you can't do anything right, or maybe you're that neighbor. I, I don't know. Uh, but, but, you know, the Bible does give us some, some thoughts on how to deal uh, with people who maybe are always offended or always upset. Um, some people are, are just miserable people, and they want you to be miserable as well. Uh, but you don't have to be a miserable person, okay? Listen, you are, if you're a Christian today, you are saved by the blood of Jesus, and no matter what is happening in the world today, your hope cannot be taken away. And so you, you, have, you have every reason to be very happy, okay? So you don't have to be a miserable person, but uh, we're going to look at people, difficult people, and I, I want to encourage you in some thoughts here tonight and how you can deal with these types of people in your life. Um, of course, this is not comprehensive. This is not all of the, the answers in dealing with people and uh, situations and difficult people. The situation can be fluid. It can be changing all the time. And, and so sometimes, you know, you, you have to kind of uh, step away from the situation and evaluate it. Um, but I think there are some principles uh, to help us. And I think we can, we can learn about what Jesus has to say about difficult people. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, Christian. What I'm about to say you are not going to like at all. I mean, this is not going to be something you're going to enjoy uh, because what the Bible teaches us is contrary to what the world would say. You know, the world would say, well, you should just give them a piece of your mind. You, you should just fight back. You, you should do this and do that. But I believe as Christians, our, our, our goal is always to evangelize. And uh, we want to be good testimony, and we want to honor the Lord. Number one, we want to make sure God is glorified uh, in our response. And I think we want to respond like Jesus. I think that's the ultimate goal, is to be like Jesus in our responses and our actions and reactions. Someone said, a callous word may kindle strife. A cruel wor word may wreck a life. A bitter word may hate instill. A brutal word may smite and kill. A gracious word may smooth the way. A joyous word may light the day. A kindly word may lessen stress. A loving word may heal and bless. You know, when Jesus dealt with difficult people, he never responded in a dismissive, uh, a dismissive pride, uh, but he responded in meekness. And I think when we look at the ministry of Jesus, we define it as meek. And you say, well, what is meek? Meek is strength under control. Think about this for just a moment. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And, and Jesus had authority under control in the responses that he, he made. I want us to look at the, the words of Jesus here in, in Luke chapter 6, and look what the Bible says in verse 27, Luke chapter 6. I do have a lot of scripture tonight. We're going to be kind of jumping around a lot here uh, throughout various scriptures, and so I try to keep up as we go through these scriptures. Write them down, study them yourself, um, you know, see if these things be so. Uh, as the Bible teaches us. Luke chapter 6, verse 27, the Bible says, But I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other, and him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away any goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Now, 
I, I want un- us to understand something that, you know, as a Christian, the, the Bible doesn't say that we are to let just people walk all over us and they can treat us any way that they want to treat us and they can do whatever. That's not what the Bible is, is saying here in this passage of Scripture. It's also not saying that we're to, to not stand up for what is right and that we're not to stand up for truth because that's not true at all. Jesus rebuked when it was necessary. And we see that in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 8, in verse 47, the Bible says, He that is of God heareth uh, God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Now that's a pretty strong rebuke for Jesus to stand before the religious leaders of the day and to say, listen, if you're of God, you would hear God's words. But the problem is, you're not of God. Now, that's a pretty strong rebuke that Jesus is, is given. So I want to give to you three characteristics in my study, three thoughts here uh, of how Jesus responded and what the Bible says how we should respond as Christians when we are dealing with people that are just hard to deal with, all right? And you could write these down. Again, uh, you can add to it, and uh, you can study it out uh, your, in your own time. Number one, I want to start here because I think this is the most important. And, and this is not just dealing with difficult people, but dealing with relate in relationships, period, is always be in control. Always be in control. You know, Jesus never lost control when he spoke to difficult people. Now, of course, we want to be spirit-led, and we don't want to be uh, carnal uh, in our responses. The Bible says this in Galatians 5.25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And the thought of walking in the Spirit is obedience to the leading of the Spirit in our life. As Christians, we have the indwelling of the Spirit of God within us, And it just makes sense to be spiritual Christians and not carnal Christians. And so we want our response to be spirit-led. We want to not be carnal in those responses. Uh, But we also want to make sure that we never lose control. You know, when we are angry, it is easy for us to uh, to lose that control. Now, the Bible gives us some principles on how we can deal indeed with an angry person. And the Bible says this, that we are to be in control uh, of our words. Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up strife. Now, when someone is angry at us, our first response is, is to get angry at them. And this is indeed uh, a natural response, that if you want to treat me that way, then I'm going to treat you just the same. Uh, but the Bible teaches us that this doesn't, this doesn't help. In fact, the Bible says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. And the word there, soft there in the Hebrew, is the word there for gentle, a gentle response, a controlled response, and not a a fit of rage. Because what happens is, is then you have the progression where one person's angry, and this person progresses the anger, and this person progresses the anger, and and then you lose control uh, in that anger. And so in order for me to respond in a gentle, ma- a gentle manner, uh, when you're angry at me, then we have to be led by the Spirit. I was uh, driving home from work. I lived at the time uh, on the, the other side of town on Spadina Road. And uh, we were, I was driving home from work, and I made a mistake. When I was turning into my driveway, I, I didn't put my, my left blinker on. And so there was a a car, a young guy, uh, who was behind me, and he was in a hurry. And so I slowed down to turn into the driveway, but I I failed to put in 
on my blinker. And so he thought I was stopping for no reason. Uh, and so he decided to pull around me and, and shoot past me. And at that same moment, I made the left turn. Uh, well, anyway, he jammed on his brakes, and I, I really didn't know what was happening. I just heard the, the loud squeal behind me, and I pulled into my driveway. I got out of my car, and he's standing there, and his face is blood red, and he is angry. Now, as a pastor, I, I can't be a brawler, and I can't be a fighter, and I wouldn't be good at it if I could. Uh, and so I, I was kind of nervous about this, and he's, he said to me in, in this angry tone, what are you doing? And um, I got this squeaky voice, and all I said back to him was, Sorry. He got back in the car and drove away. Now, I could have made that very worse by responding angrily. What, what's your hurry, man? You know, where's the fire? What's your problem? You, you know, I could have made that worse. But, you know, a soft answer, the Bible says, turn uh, away wrath. And so we want to be controlled in the words that we say. Let, let me say this. Not every criticism, we're talking about now uh, someone who is difficult to deal with, not every criticism, not every opposition, not every comment deserves a response. It doesn't always deserve a response. You don't always have to win every argument. Um, I, I read this story, I thought it was interesting. Al Smith was a, a presidential, uh, presidential candidate in 1928, and he was making a speech when a, a heckler yelled out to him, tell him what's on your mind, Al, and it won't take long. And Smith grinned and pointed at the man and showed it, and he said, stand up, partner, and tell him what's on both of our minds. It won't take any longer. <laughs> Now, now, you can respond that way. You, you can respond to the criticism. You can respond to the argument. You can respond to the comment. But sometimes the proper response is no response at all. And I want to show you that Jesus, he responded this way. Uh, look what the Bible says, John chapter 8. Could you turn there with me? John chapter 8. And look what the Bible says here. John chapter 8. And verse number 6, John 8 and verse number 6. The Bible says this, John chapter 8 and verse 6, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Jesus didn't always answer to those who accused him, those who criticized him. We also see this in the judgment hall when Jesus is standing before the chief priests in Mark chapter 14. Turn there with me, Mark chapter, uh, excuse me, 15, Mark 15 and verse number three. And look what the Bible says here, Mark chapter 15 and verse number three. Notice the response of the Lord Jesus here. The Bible says in verse 3, and the chief priests accused him of many things. Look at this. But he answered nothing. You don't always have to respond to everything. Some people, you know what, they come to you and they, even in spiritual things, they ask questions and they're not looking for answers they're just looking for arguments. And, and sometimes it is better for us to not respond to those things. A Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 11, the Bible says this, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it until afterwards. Here's a great truth that I think we all need to, to know when we are dealing with difficult people, 
it is better for us to step away and think about a response than just uttering what is on our heart or on our mind. Uh, because this often makes the situation worse. Sometimes it's best just to think about a response, to pray about a response uh, before acknowledging a comment or a criticism. Now, I want to give you two passages of Scripture. Let's, let's turn there. Proverbs chapter 26 and, and verse number 4. I want us to notice here in the Bible, uh, this is not a contradiction. This is an opportunity to, uh, to determine the best approach when we deal with difficult people. Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 4, notice what the Bible says here. It says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. So you're dealing with a difficult person. You, you can be that difficult person. You're, you're dealing with an angry person. You can become that angry person by responding. And so the Bible says, don't answer a fool according to his folly. But verse number five says, Answer a fool according to his folly. You say, well, what is it then? Do I answer or do I not? Well, you need to ask for direction from the Lord. And every situation is different. Uh, every response uh, is, is to be catered to that person. And so you need the direction from the Lord to help you. And so the Bible says, listen, be careful when you, you answer a fool or a foolish man uh, because you're going, to, you're going to travel down that road. And if you get in an argument with an unreasonable person, you can't reason with an unreasonable person. You just can't. And so you go down that road, then you're in for a, a difficult time. And so there are times when we have to step back. There's times when we have to be silent. And I think it's also important for us to understand um, that we are accountable to God for the words that we say. And we want to be a good testimony. We want to make sure that uh, we are honoring the Lord uh, with our words. Uh, the Bible teaches us that, those things. And so uh, we want to make sure that we are in control of the words that we say. Now, here's a couple of thoughts here about dealing with difficult people that Jesus often used. Jesus often would answer difficult people by asking them a question. Instead of responding to them, uh, ask them a question about what they've said or what they believe. Mark chapter 11 and verse 28, the Bible says, I say unto them, by what authority uh, does thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask of you one question. And answer me, I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Before I answer your question, you're going to have to answer my question. And so sometimes you can diffuse a circumstance or a situation um, by asking a question. You have a neighbor who you can't please, a neighbor who you try your best to, to be a good neighbor and you know nothing you do is right. And sometimes you might just have to say, what do I have to do to make you happy? What do I have to do uh, to help you? What do I have to do uh, to be a blessing to you? So questions are excellent ways to get people to think uh, about their circumstance, the way that uh, they're treating you. And of course, there's the obvious ones about spiritual things like where will you spend eternity? You, you know, uh, do you want to please God? We talk about Christians and maybe uh, within the spiritual uh, battle that we have, these are all good questions to get people uh, to think about the scriptures and what the Bible has. And of course, we want to make sure uh, as Christians, we are indeed directing people to the Bible. Philippians 2.16 says, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We want to make sure uh, that we direct people to the Bible and make sure that the Bible influences and impacts our life as well. Because words, they have great influence. 
in the life, uh, the life of people. I, I, think of, I think of Peter, when Peter had denied the Lord, and you know the story, Peter denied the Lord, and he says, I go a fishing. And what do the other disciples say? They say, we, we go also with thee. The words we say have influence in the lives of our children, in the lives of our coworkers, and so we want to make sure that we are uh, honoring the Lord in our words. All right, so not only do we want to be controlled in our words, but we also want to be controlled in our actions and in our reactions in our life. I want to once again reference the Lord Jesus here. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 20. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 20. We don't want to be a difficult person in order to combat uh, a difficult person. And we definitely don't want to act like a difficult person in order to win that battle. Our goal is always to honor the Lord. 1 Peter 2, verse 20, the Bible says, For what glory is it? Verse 20, 1 Peter 2, If when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even here unto uh, were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who uh, his own self bore, uh, bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. The word guile there is the idea of deception. Jesus didn't try to manipulate people. He didn't have any guile in his mouth. Jesus didn't seek for revenge. Jesus didn't threaten them. I, I think that, you know, within the, the idea of marriage, uh, you know, when, when two individuals are working on the marriage, it's, it's not good for one to threaten with divorce or, you know, threaten to leave them. And this, this obviously uh, is, is not of the Lord and not Christ-like. And we see that Jesus didn't have this attitude at all. The actions of Jesus were trusting his Father's plan and praying for them. And, and I think this is important because we all, always want to have the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you can't know the heart of, the, of an individual. I, I don't know your heart here. I don't know what you're thinking as I'm preaching this message. You might be thinking, when is this guy going to stop? I mean, I, I don't know your heart, and you don't know my heart. And that difficult person, you don't know their heart. You don't know what they've gone through. You don't know the stress. You, you know, you go to a, a cashier and, you know, you're, if they're already cashiers anymore, I, they're hard to find these days. Uh, but you go to a store, you go to a cashier and, you know, they, they have a, a bad attitude and you're thinking, what, what is your problem? Like, I, I haven't done anything to you, but, but you don't know the struggles that they're going through. You, you don't know how much it took for them to get to work that day. And, and so I, I think it's important for us to understand that when we're dealing with difficult people, we don't know the heart of an individual. And we can try and we can try and we can try to be reasonable and helpful and all of those things. And nothing works. And you say, well, Pastor Burns, what is the answer? Well, sometimes it comes to the point in your life where you just have to leave that person with God. Leave that person with God. I think of in, in, in Jude 9, when Michael the archangel were contending uh, with the devil and they disputed over the body of, of Moses. And the Bible says that Michael the archangel durst not, he would not bring to him a railing accusation. But what did he say? He just said, the Lord rebuke thee. And, and, and sometimes in our life, we had to get to the point 
where we have to guard our response, we have to guard our actions because we can't control the actions of other people. And there's times in our life that we just have to leave that person with God and say, God, you're going to have to help them. You're going to have to deal with the heart. You're going to have to make a difference because there's nothing that I can do that, that could make a difference on the surface. You have to deal with the heart of that individual. But we want to make sure that we act in a way that always brings glory to God. That's the most important Romans chapter 12 and verse 19, you can mark this scripture down. Romans 12 and verse 19, the Bible says this, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, I will repay, saith the Lord. You know where we get ourselves in big trouble is we start thinking that we have to do what God and only God can do. And we have to step back from these situations with difficult people, uh, different difficult relationships, and say, Lord, I give that person to you. Uh, you know, you have to work in their hearts. So we want to be controlled in our words. We want to be controlled in our, our actions. But we also want to be controlled in our attitudes. Our attitudes. Our attitudes. We never want our relationships with difficult people to affect the other relationships in our lives. Think about this. We don't want our relationship with a difficult person to be seen in our relationships with our children, our relationships with our spouse, our relationship with others, and we see that, and I've experienced that, and I've lived that myself, where you have a hard day at work, and you come home, and you, you don't take it out on your coworkers because you don't want them to think bad of you. What do you take it out on? You take it out on your kids. They have to deal the brunt of that difficult person. And they're stepping back in their mind saying, hey, wait a minute, I, I've been good to you. Why, why am I getting your wrath? And this is natural for us to respond this way. We want to make sure that we do not uh, have a bad attitude or allow uh, these things to change our attitudes. James 3 verse 14 says this, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. We have to get this, this, proudful, uh, this prideful attitude of strife and envying where, you know, we have this, this attitude of friction, this attitude of distress, this, this attitude of, of, of contention. And the Bible says if you have this attitude, don't dare pat yourself on the back. Don't dare glory in this. Don't lie to yourself. This is definitely not beneficial for your life. James says in the next verse that this wisdom is not from God. He says it's actually uh, earthly, sensual, and it's devilish. This attitude of a, of a challenging person can, can permeate our life, and we can pick up that bitter attitude, that, that, that uh, mean spirit, and we never want that attitude in our life. You say, well, Pastor Burns, what attitude do, should I have? Well, I'm glad you asked tonight. It's a good question, great question. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 5 teaches us this. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 5 gives us the answer, and we see this idea here of this mind, and the mind is speaking of our thinking, our attitude, and it says in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, look at this, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Did Jesus deal with difficult people? Absolutely, every single day. But how did he respond? He had a submissive, he had a joyful, he had an obedient and a humble attitude. And this is what we ought to have in our life as well. 
It's an attitude that prefers one another. It's an attitude that's not interested in winning the argument, but caring for the soul. It's the attitude that serves. It goes deep from within, from the work of the Holy Spirit within us. It's not our natural tendency to want to help our enemy or to love our enemy. By the way, that teaches us that love is a choice. People say, well, I've just, I fell out of love. I don't love them anymore. Love is a choice. You don't have a, a fuzzy feeling for your enemy. You choose to love them. And the Bible says, love your enemy. And so we are to, we are to have the heart of love. Uh, listen, people are going to have opinions. People are going to say things. People are going to do things. But we cannot allow this to change our attitude toward people, toward God, toward the church, toward the Bible. Control what you can control, our own responses. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 2, now this is speaking here of a, a wife who's married to an unsaved husband. And notice what Peter's advice is. Peter says, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Now, chaste means, uh, speaks of holiness. And so what is the advice of Peter, or I should say, what is the advice of God for a, a wife who knows the Lord, or vice versa, a husband who knows the Lord, has an unsaved uh, spouse? The Bible says, be godly, be godly. And by your conversation, an old English word, it means the life you live, by your life, they would see Christ in you, and this would make an eternal difference in their hearts. We need to make sure that we have self-control. We need to say things that honor the Lord and do things that honor the Lord. Even when we are surrounded with those who we would perceive to hate us, that would despise us, those who we would classify as our enemy, the Bible says we are to be always in control. By the way, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 2, the idea there of fear is speaking of reverence to, toward God. And it really all comes down to our reverence for God and our respect for God impacts how we treat other people as well. A life that puts God first and honors God with their words, their actions, and their attitude is a good example to an unbeliever. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says this, for he that will love life and see good days. How many want to love life? No one? All right. <laughs> How many want to see good days? Yeah. This, look, look, the Bible has some practical advice for us. If you want to love life and you want to see good days, look at this. Let him refrain his tongue from evil. Control what you say. And his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil, turn from that which is wrong, and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. It's so important for us to live a life that is in control. Don't let bitterness overcome you. I have been around long enough to see bitterness crunch and conquer Christians. Don't be a Christian who is overcome or controlled by a bitter spirit. Someone said you may get in a fight with a skunk and win, but you won't ever smell the same. And when you get involved, you get in an argument with a bitter person, you get in an argument with an unreasonable person, you may win that argument, but it's going to impact you in a way you don't want to be impacted. And so you've got to choose your response. Is this worth the battle? Direct them to the Scriptures. Sometimes it's better to say nothing. The Bible says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. All right, that's point number one. Wow, we got we to gotta go fast here. Point number two is be loving. Be loving. I heard the story of a preacher who, when he first came to the church uh, to pastor, he was a young man, and uh, he wasn't liked very much. No one in the congregation liked him. And uh, he said that he made a commitment to respond three ways uh, within that church. 
And he said, here's my three ways. The first way is silence. The second way is love. And the third way is prayer. And eventually that pastor won over those who opposed him. Now, it's hard to preach to people who uh, don't like you. <laughs> it's, it's hard to preach to people who are not willing to hear. Uh, but it's even harder to serve that person. You know, and, and the Bible teaches us in our text here in Luke 6 to love our enemies, to do good, to lend, hoping for nothing again, for your reward shall be great. So God is telling us that these difficult people that come into our lives, we're going to have to respond in a way that is not natural for us. And that response is to be uh, that in love. Now, we think about at our workplace for just a moment, and maybe you have a boss or maybe you've had a boss that you really liked and he was really good to you and he was really nice and all those things and you really liked him. And it was easy to submit to him. It was easy to serve him. It was easy to work for him. Uh, but then maybe you change jobs or whatever the case is and, and now you have a boss who's not so kind. And, and maybe you have a boss who uses you and takes credit for all your work and you know, he, he's just not a nice guy. He's difficult. He, he, he's hard to get along with. He's hard to please. What does the Bible say about that? Surely the Bible says you don't have to be nice to that person. Surely the Bible says you don't have to be kind to that person. Well, look what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Let me read it to you. It says, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle but also to the froward. Wow. The froward. You know what the word froward means? It's a, it's a word that means curved or quirked. It's a word that represents someone who doesn't care about you. It's a word that represents someone who uses you. And the Bible says not only are you to have a good attitude of humility toward those who are good and gentle, but you're also to have a good attitude, uh, attitude toward those who are froward, because this honors the Lord. You know, when you go to work, you have a boss, but you know who your real boss is? God. <laughs> and we are to work, and we are to work hard, because it honors the Lord. And that, as Christians, is our desire to honor the Lord. Now, again, we don't have, um, we don't have what's inside us to naturally respond in love and kindness to people who are angry at us or, or, you know, use us or all of those things. I read an article about a little boy in um, her second grade class who habitually stole things from the other children. And uh, he would hide all of those items under his desk. And the teacher reasoned with him, but to no avail. Uh, the principal reasoned with him, but no avail. The teacher tried several different kinds of discipline, but never, nothing ever worked. The child continued to steal things from the other students, and this never ended. And then the teacher said to the principal, possibly the child take things that do not belong to him to compensate for the lack of parental love. And so let's just try to lavish love on him. And so that's what they did for the next couple of, of months. The, the teacher and the principal uh, both just, just demonstrated a Christ-like love uh, to this child. And within a short while, a wonderful change was observed. He no longer took things from the other children, and his attitude changed completely. I think there's a great power in just showing people grace and love. And, and remember, grace is unmerited favor, because the first thing you're going to say is, well, they don't deserve it. Well, if they deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. Grace is that unmerited favor. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 8, charity never faileth. And so we need to show love. Love indeed reaches the heart. Grace, that unmerited favor, sometimes is what people need to see. It's, it's God's grace that when we were separated from him, when we were sinners, it's the grace of God that when we were God's enemy, he uh, showed mercy upon us and, and helped us. And so we need to make sure that we also 
uh, are people of grace. And so when we are dealing with difficult people, uh, I'm saying that maybe what they need is some grace in that situation. Uh, Maybe what they need is to see the love of God uh, in your life. Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 6, the Bible says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. How are we to answer every man? We're to have responses that uh, have grace. And so grace uh, indeed is that unmerited favor that God showed toward us. This means showing kindness. This means showing restraint. This means being charitable. Maybe that neighbor that always is is uptight and always fighting against you. Maybe buy them a birthday gift or or, or maybe do something unexpected that they don't deserve. I get it. They don't deserve, but show them the very grace of God. Encourage them. Compliment them. Build them up. Show them grace. But listen, I think also I think it's important for us to understand that within the idea of showing grace, we also have to show them truth. And I never want to, to say, well, you know what, we just kind of let everything go and, you know, and, and be peacemakers. But there are times where we have, to, we have to take a stand. There's times when we have to speak the truth. But the Bible says that we are to speak the truth in love. In other words, the intention of truth is not to win the argument. The intention of truth is not to show them uh, what you think or put them in their place. The intention of truth is always to reach the heart. And so we want to be those who take the truth of the Bible and live the truth of the Bible. Philippians 1 verse 27 says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Never let your life and the gospel message contradict. Remember, you may have an opportunity. You may have an opportunity to tell that person about Jesus Christ. When I worked at Walmart in Bible college, there was a lady who always gave me a hard time. She knew I was in Bible college and and uh, she, she just, she didn't like me very well. I don't know why. I'm such a likable guy. <laughs> that was a joke. I am a likable guy, I think. Um, anyway, she, she, was, she was always on my case. And, you know, uh, they would always say, those, those Bible college students, they're a bunch of know-it-alls. Well, we didn't know anything at that point, And we don't know anything now. Uh, but I remember one time she came up to me. And and this is after all the strife and all the things that she caused. And she said to me, she said, hey, she goes, my sister just got diagnosed with cancer. And I'm wondering if you could, if you could pray for her. What an opportunity. Now, if, if my responses to her were to just win the argument or put her in her place or tell her, a piece of my mind. I don't have much to offer. I don't have much to give. Uh, But if that was the case, you would miss out on an opportunity, an opportunity uh, to be a help. And so I I think you have to look at the bigger picture here because there may come a time in your life where they're going to come and look for answers. And if you show grace and love and compassion and control what you say and control your attitude then you might just have an opportunity to be a blessing and a help to that individual. Uh, I want to give you my last point, and I'll be done here. I'll go through it quickly. And that's simply this, that I think difficult people who are, are hard to deal with, I think they, they come into our life because I think God teaches us some important lessons through them. And I, I think number three, by the way, is grow in grace. And I think that, I think we need to take some time in our life to step back and say, okay, what lessons can I learn from this person uh, in my life? Um, Romans chapter 16 and verse 17, the Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Not every difficult person has to be your best friend. You don't have to spend every day with them but you do have to influence them for the gospel's sake. 
and you say, well, I have a lot of difficult people in my life. Well, maybe you're the difficult person, and maybe you need to look at your life and say, how can I change? It reminds me of the story of a wife who calls her husband and says, honey, I was watching the news, and there's, there's this crazy man driving the wrong way on the expressway. And the husband was like, honey, there's not one. There's a whole bunch of them driving the wrong way on the expressway. So, so sometimes you might have to look at your own life and say, hey, maybe I'm the difficult one. Uh, and let the Lord speak to your heart in that. But the reality is we have difficult people in our lives, and they're everywhere, and they're on, it's unavoidable. Uh, so how, how, what lessons can we learn from them? Well, just a couple of thoughts here. Number one, I think we can learn patience. We can learn patience. Matthew 18, 21, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Now, remember when Jesus is speaking this, he's talking about the same offense 70 times. And uh, uh, he's talking about the same offense here seven times is what Peter's saying. And the reality is, is that the Lord Jesus is not listing a number here. He's not saying, well, you know what? I want you to do some math and figure this out. What Jesus is trying to teach us is that we are to be forgiving patient people. And this offense is the same offense over a period of time, the same offense, the same offense, and God wants us to be a patient people. And I think it's important because people are hurting, um, people are deceived, you ever argue over religion or the Bible and you say, I just don't understand why you can't get this. Uh, you have to remember that, you know, the devil is real and he's blinded the minds of them which believe not. And they are spiritually blinded to that truth. And so there's a spiritual battle. And, and also remember, people are sinners. If you think you're going to live your life without being offended, without someone saying something or doing something, it's just, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna happen. And so we need to be patient people with, with others. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, the Bible says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. You say, well, yeah, that's the pastor. He needs to be patient. Uh, but wait a minute, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 14 says, now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Be patient. And, you know, difficult people, we can learn some compassion, we can learn some caring, we can learn to be self-controlled uh, in those circumstances. But I believe also, and I'll be done here, I believe we can learn to be understanding. We can be, learn to understand. I, I try to, as I meet people... I try to, to understand that the response of people, um, you know, you, again, you don't always know what's happening in their life. And I want to show you a passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3. I read this several years ago. I've underlined it in my Bible, and I try to live this because I just think that this is a, a really important truth for all of us. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3. I believe the theme of these verses here is about God's help in our life. And the, the Bible says here in verse number three, remember them that are in bonds. Now, it's speaking of prisoners for the gospel's sake, uh, as bound with them. Now, that's a pretty incredible statement, to remember those in, in bonds, those who are jailed for the cause of Christ, as if you're present with them, as you're a part of that. Now, look what the Bible says here. I, I, I like this. It says, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Now, when you hear the story of someone who got diagnosed with cancer, and you think to yourself, wow, you know, that's too bad. Sorry to hear that. You know, the Bible teaches us that we are to have a perspective that as we ourselves are also in the body, as we ourselves are also flesh and blood, that we could get that diagnosis, that we could have that in our life next week, next year, next, you know, uh, next tomorrow, whatever the case is. And our response to these people, 
are to be a response of compassion and a response of love. Now, I get it. In life, we're so busy that we can't keep our own things straight, more or less the life of other people. But I think the Bible, the Bible is clear teaching us uh, that we are to be a compassionate people and we're to love people because God loves people. There's not a person that you will meet on the street that God doesn't love. Think about that, that God doesn't love and that God didn't die for. And so we're to have that compassion in our life and help people and encourage people as we can. And when that comes to difficult people, we have to understand that we don't know what they're dealing with. We don't know their difficulties. And sometimes we have to leave them with God and pray for them that God would stir their hearts. We don't have all of the answers and we cannot see what's happening in their heart. But I believe this, that God will help us. He will give us the words to say. Sometimes we say nothing. Sometimes there's no point of saying anything. But we can always pray for them. We can always bring them before the Lord. And we have to make sure that our response is to be honoring to the Lord. We cannot lose control in our actions and our words and our attitudes. We need to be gracious and kind, even when that person doesn't deserve it. Grow from the situation that we're placed in because we can learn something from everybody, even if it's what not to do. We can learn. And I want to say this, and I think this is one of the most important things. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Because you don't know why God has placed them in your life. Can you imagine the man who had to go meet the Apostle Paul for the first time? I mean, that's a terrible job. God, are you sure he's changed? I've heard about this man. God can use you to be a blessing in their life. You know, you may be the only Bible that someone ever reads. You may be the Bible that they read today. And we want to make sure it honors the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together.